My first two guests tonight have nearly 60 years of Senate service between them, from the mid-80s through the mid-aughts. Both former Senate Majority Leaders, Democrat Tom Daschle, Republican Trent Lott, are no strangers to the tough talk and partisan rhetoric of Capitol Hill. But these days, the two believe that has become a national crisis. Hence the title of the great new book, Crisis Point, Why We Must and How We Can Overcome Our Broken Politics in Washington and Across America. But before I introduce the pair of political peacekeepers, let's call them, I don't want you to think it's always been a bipartisan love fest. As a husband and a father, I am offended by the president's behavior and by the tragic example that he has set for the young people of this country. Unfortunately, last spring, Republicans chose exactly the wrong solution. They made a huge tax cut their number one priority ahead of everything else and discarded the framework of fiscal responsibility. That's when they were young and irresponsible. Now they're with me tonight, former <laughs> Senators Trent Lott and Tom Daschle. Gentlemen, it's really good to see you. Thank Look at you all that dark with... hair, Jim. <laughs> What's that? What all that dark hair? So uh, 60 years between you. Is this the worst in your years in politics, the, the dysfunction? 15% approval in Congress? It is. It is. It, you have to go back uh, to uh, perhaps the Civil War to find a time 150 years ago when it was this bad. And it really pains us to say that. Uh, we don't want it to be that. There are things that have caused it. We think that it's been gradual. There's not been one thing that triggered it, but things are really bad and we've got to fix it. I want to get to the causes in just a second, Senator Lott, but are you guys blameless? I mean, you did the impeachment thing. You blocked Bush nominations when a lot of people said you got to let the president have it. Were you at least part of the problem in your time? I know you respected each other. I know you talked to each other. Were you or we no? Don't, we don't profess purity. Uh -huh. uh, we had our philosophical and, and uh, political disagreements and sometime we overplayed our hand. But we also, and we went through a lot of difficult things, some of which were beyond our control, like 9-11 and the anthrax sure. attack and the 50-50 Senate. But in spite of our, our mistakes, which we made, and the difficult times that we dealt with those things, we got results. We kept focusing on, okay, how can we move this bill or that bill, whether it was a budget, a defense issue, or even basic things like safe drinking water. Before we talk about the problem and solutions, speaking of impeachment, briefly tell what happened, a phone call you got just a couple <laughs> days after you voted to impeach your president. Well, we had to do, and first of all, we didn't create that. Uh, the, uh, he was impeached by the House. We that. had to act on that. Understood. We had a constitutional responsibility. And we tried very hard. And Tom, and this is where we did work together. I called Tom the next day after the House voted, I said, Tom, I'm not happy this is in our lap, but it's here. Now, how can we get this done responsibly uh, in a way that people will feel good about it and then we can go on and do our work after that? So we did it, and I'm glad to vote on Friday, and I voted for two articles of, mm -hmm. of impeachment. Uh, the following Thursday, of course, th that failed, but the following Thursday I get a call from President Clinton, and he wanted to talk about a piece of legislation. I don't even remember what it was, but he didn't mention Never mentioned it. Never mentioned it. And we okay. went forward. Okay, let's get to current events. Let's go down a list of at least a few of the things you guys mentioned in your book. Let's start with airplanes, for example. What do you mean by airplanes, Senator Daschle? Well, Jim, the airplane has really created a new dynamic in Washington. It's changed the social life. It's changed the way the members of Congress interact with one another. Now they leave on Thursday. They come back on Tuesday. They try to run the country on Wednesday. And that's not much of an exaggeration. Therefore, they don't get to know each other. They don't get to spend the time in the committees to work on the stuff. They don't get a chance to deal and to work through all of the challenges we face from a legislative perspective. How do you fix that? Well, I think what we've got to do is create five-day work weeks again to say, look, the airplane is always going to be there, but you can only use it on Saturdays and uh, not on Thursdays. You've got to spend the whole week, Monday through Friday, legislating. Three Couldn't weeks Harry out of Reid every have month. done that when he was Majority Leader or Mitch McConnell now just say you work Monday to Friday, you go home well, Friday at 3 o'clock? Yeah, yeah, Paul, Paul Ryan could do it, and I think he will, and I'm, I'm pushing that, the new Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, it was just about maybe four years ago when uh, they changed that in the House. Uh, Eric Cantor was the uh, majority leader at the time. And get this, they went to two weeks on and two weeks off. And, it, you know, and, and the Senate was doing, th I guess, three weeks on and one week off, but they were only working, you know, like two days. <laughs> you can't do that. And the job is in Washington. Being a legislator uh, is not something you can just do on the side. you got to work at it. 
But if they were just going home, it'd be one thing. What they're doing more and more is raising money. They're all over the country raising money, going to fundraisers, dialing for dollars. Money is driving a big part of the schedule. Well, that's schedule. number two, Melissa. So what do you do to fix that? There's a First Amendment. We know where the Supreme Court is on those. How do you fix the money problem? Well, I think we've got to find ways to, to incent, to encourage. We want to see if we can find constitutional ways to limit the amount of time like when campaigns. Like what? Well, how about not raising money while you legislate? That's, that's actually established in a lot of states today. You can't fundraise and legislate in the same time. And you think the Supreme and, Court would buy that? Well, they haven't denied it in the states. It's going on in the states as we speak. You think money's a solution, a problem too, but oh, when yeah. you watch television a couple nights ago and you hear that Shelley Adelson, a Dorchester kid from Boston, now owning the Sands and more, wants to figure out who to give 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars and because of Citizens United, he can. You think they were on firm ground with Citizens United, don't you? How do you ever fix the money mess well, without you, fixing that? Well, you know, look, uh, there's some people who say, okay, we need to find a way to, to limit the money, uh, you know, and uh, how you do that without limiting speech under the Supreme Court decision. Basically, I agree with the decision, but there are some things I don't like. I'm, I'm very concerned about the super PACs, the amount of money they have, and who, who gives to those super PACs. And the fact, by the way, uh, they they get involved in candidates' campaigns, sometimes to their own candidates' dismay and dislike. So one of the things that we, we suggest, we, it's no use to argue about what we can't do. Constitutional problem is the real one. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do it, but the process is long and difficult. So what is another way to do this thing? Uh, we, we, you know, we recommend things like, uh, how about a single primary day to cut down on this thing we're going through right now where it goes on and on and on, beginning with Iowa and winding up with who knows where, Michigan. But doesn't that benefit the, the Trumps of the world and the Hillary Clinton? Hillary Clinton's your candidate. I know you're a John Kasich supporter. Yeah. Doesn't it support the people who are the richest to be able to compete everywhere on day one? Uh, well, and uh, I, you know, I really don't think so. I think it would help uh, cut down on the overall, uh, overall amount of money that's involved. I think it would help be, uh, people's attention focused. I think it would cut down on the negativity. Do There's you? a voter fatigue that has set yeah. in, and we've got to deal with the voter fatigue. There are downsides to a lot of the solutions sure. we argue for, but we've got to recognize something has to be done to deal with the very low participation. How about weekends? How about a weekend vote weekends, like some other early countries? Early voting, uh, greater yes, opportunities. No? Oh, no, no. I'm Oh, yes, I'm, I'm you're Saturday, Saturday voting. Why are we voting on Tuesday? Why are we uh, voting I'm, on I'm Tuesday? I'm the son of a blue-collar shipyard worker, union member, pipe fitter. And he went in that shipyard early, and he got off late, and he was dirty. He'd been, had been inhaling asbestos. And then he had to go home and clean up and get to the polls and vote before they closed, which in those days I think was like 6 o'clock. Why don't we vote on Saturday? You know, gentlemen, you're, you identify problems, I think, quite well in your book. Your solution is reform. The solution of a huge swath of the American people is Donald Trump. Why are they wrong and you're right? Why isn't a Trump, I don't just mean Trump, I mean the generic Trump. Why isn't Trump the answer? Well, uh, first of all, I just don't uh, buy the uh, outsider argument. Do I like the idea of businessmen and women being involved? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm a lawyer, but I think, you know, it'd be good if we had m more non-lawyers uh, in the Congress. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have a problem with people coming in and have not actually done the job, don't understand the players, don't know the players. Okay, he's been a great international businessman. But I want somebody like Kasich that has actually balanced a budget for the federal government. But if it wasn't Kasich, if Trump got the nomination, would you vote for him? Uh, depending on uh, you know who was against in the primary or in the general, probably I would. I, I, look, I think, yeah, oh yeah, Jim, oh yeah. I think the thing Certainly that we against both feel uh, Bernie about. Sanders or Hillary. The thing yeah. we think strongly about is is you got experience does count. Would you do a heart transplant with a guy who's never had a heart transplant? If he said, look, I've never done this before, but I think I can transplant your heart or your lungs. Well, you know, running the country is even more complicated than a heart transplant. And, and, and yet we're saying, let's give somebody who's never had a minute of experience come in and run the country and maybe even threaten the, the world as we know it today. But gentlemen, well, with I hope most people would agree on the experience thing, but you believe we should be more bipartisan. There's a reward for partisanship. Right behind Donald Trump in your primary well, you. is Ted Cruz, the most partisan Republican in Congress. Well, How do you explain that? You know, I was in the House of Representatives for 16 years. I was the Republican whip for eight of those working with the Reagan administration. Then I moved over to the Senate, and, and I was always in the minority in the House. So I got up every morning trying to think, how can I beat the Democrats today? I came to the Senate as a partisan warrior. Within six months, I would said, you know what? This is not going real good. Uh, I'm making people mad. I'm not getting anything done. I'm concerned, and I don't really know the rules. 
I got to change my conduct. I spent six months going around and talking to senators of both parties saying, tell me how I can do a good job for my constituents and for my country as a senator. I changed my conduct, and six and a half years later, I was a majority leader. But we've created an environment where that partisanship is rewarded, where the yeah. more outrageous you are, uh, the more attention you get. I'm not saying your program, but a lot of media rewards the sensationalism, the hyperbolic rhetoric, the partisan confrontational tone, uh, the lack of civility. That's rewarded in part in the media, and I think that's part of the problem as well. Believe it or not, I agree with you. Only 30 seconds left. You're going to be at the Ed Edward M. Kennedy Institute tonight. Right. Was Kennedy as good at this bipartisanship, quickly, both of you, as legends suggest? Emphatically, yes. He was one of the most partisan, but also one of the best wheelers and dealers, the best compromisers, one of the best movers of legislation history has known. I actually was friends with him. We worked together on occasion. One time I told a civic club in my home state that, uh, that and after it was over, an old guy came up from the back and he said, you know, you did a good job at that part about Kennedy. Don't say that no more. <laughs> Senator Daschle, thank you thank so you, much. Jeff. Senator Lott, your book yeah, is great. You. I hope thank people you. take you. the time to read it.